Hey, brother! Ben, we talk a lot about Voldemort, and sure, we give him a hard time, but that's because he deserves it, and we'll never stop. But today, we're actually going to talk about a time when Voldemort was seemingly a little more capable before we talk about his eminent failure. Voldemort, of course, tracked down lots of very rare magical artifacts to turn into horcruxes. I mean, items from Slytherin and Hufflepuff, a crown from Ravenclaw that had been seen by no other living person since its original owner died? But he never managed to find something from Gryffindor. Or did he? Today, I want to discuss Voldemort's failed horcrux. <laughs> According to Dumbledore, Voldemort reserved the making of Horcruxes for particularly significant deaths. He seems to have reserved the process of making Horcruxes for particularly significant deaths. You would certainly have been that. He believed that in killing you, he was destroying the danger the prophecy had outlined. He believed he was making himself invincible. I'm sure he was intending to make his final Horcrux with your death. Spot on Dumbledore, am I right? Certainly better than this. All right, you put your name in a couple of fire. So let's take a look at the Horcruxes in order of creation. First was the diary with the death of Moaning Myrtle. For the ring, he killed his father, Tom Riddle Sr. For the locket, a muggle tramp. It doesn't really seem that significant. The cup was Hepzibah Smith, an actual descendant from Hufflepuff. The diadem was an Albanian peasant, and Nagini was Bertha Jorkins. Yes, I totally agree with you, Dumbledore. Significant deaths. Or just whoever happened to have the misfortune of standing near him when he found his new shiny toy. In my head, it went something like this. Hey, a crown! Is that a peasant? Horcruxes Horcrux. Horcrux are easy. Seriously though, a peasant was okay for Ravenclaw's diadem, and yet you just had to have Harry Potter's blood for your resurrection potion? But speaking of Harry, let's get back to what Dumbledore was saying to him. That Voldemort was planning to make his final horcrux with Harry's death. Which means, when he went to the Potter's house, he must have already had whatever item he was going to turn into a horcrux with him. Right? So the question is... What was it? Because whatever it is, you'd think it would be something powerful and magical and they would have found it in the rubble of the potter's house, right? Well, not necessarily. Not if, say, it could vanish? We know early on in Voldemort's quest for trophies to turn into horcruxes that he acquired items from Slytherin and Hufflepuff, and Dumbledore guesses that when Voldemort comes back to interview for the Defense Against the Dark Arts position that he's actually there to search for items from Ravenclaw and Gryffindor. So here's the thing, Harry, he's already got Slytherin and Hufflepuff and he obviously wants to complete his collection. I think he came back to the school to find the other ones. I don't know about Ravenclaw, but he definitely didn't get Gryffindor. I've got the sword right here. Well done, me. Great voice. Now, interestingly, we know that Dumbledore is wrong on at least one point. On the day in question, Voldemort actually already has Ravenclaw's diadem and uses that opportunity at the school to hide it in the Room of Requirement. But I think that Dumbledore is wrong again, at least partially in regards to the sword. Yes, it is safe, but I don't think Voldemort didn't find it. Voldemort may have been willing to kill a tramp and a peasant for some of his horcruxes, but do you remember why Slughorn's memory in particular was just so important? Seven. Merlin's beard tongue. Seven. Because he wants to make seven. That is why the memory was so important. The point is, I do agree with Dumbledore that Harry's death was absolutely meant to be the creation of the final Horcrux. The one that makes him immortal. The one that completes his little project. And at that point, he had already made five. The Diary, the Ring, and in order, Slytherin, Hufflepuff, and Ravenclaw. Are you telling me he just gave up there that on his big moment to become immortal, he just stops the search for something from Gryffindor, the thing that would complete his collection. Again, it's not just the next Horcrux, it's the final Horcrux, the one that makes him immortal, number seven, and it would be an object from Gryffindor while he was killing the prophesied chosen one in Godric's Hollow, Gryffindor's hometown. And, 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 and what, he settles for anything else? That just, that just doesn't sound like 
Voldemort. I think he absolutely had that sword with him when he went to kill the Potters and planned on making it his final Horcrux. Uh, but Jay, how could he have found it? The sword only presents itself to worthy Gryffindors. Great question. Ah, true, but how do you know that, viewer? Because Scrimgeour tells it to Harry when he is refusing to give him the sword. According to reliable historical sources, the sword may present itself to any worthy Gryffindor says Scrimgeour. Reliable historical sources. Do you know what that means? It means that even though we the reader only ever see the sword present itself to Harry and Neville, that obviously it has presented itself to other people throughout history because there are reliable historical sightings of it happening. Sightings that have then been recorded and list its powers. Reliable historical sources, meaning well-known, meaning Voldemort, the guy who is obsessed with finding objects from the founders could probably easily enough figure out that the sword at least existed and how it normally presents itself to people. But still, true, he's not a Gryffindor, so how did he get it? Uh, easy. You basically just have to manufacture a situation wherein the sword might present itself to a worthy Gryffindor. And since the main opposing force to his army is the Order of the Phoenix, which is almost made up entirely of ex-Gryffindors, well, that's not a bad starting point. Think about it. Dumbledore, the Potters, Moody, Sirius, Lupin, McGonagall, Hagrid, all in the order, all Gryffindors. Plus, and this is the really important part, there is a weird gap of time during which Voldemort absolutely knew where the Potters were, but did not kill Harry. It's a little tricky to figure out, but stick with me here. When you first discover that Peter Pettigrew actually became the Potter's secret keeper, you sort of read it, and in my mind at least, this is how the order of events went. First, Sirius convinces the Potters to use Peter instead. Peter immediately tells Voldemort. Voldemort jumps in the air and goes, woohoo! And then Voldemort shows up like the next night to kill the Potters. Like when I read Prisoner of Azkaban, it always felt to me like maybe the Potters were only in hiding for a night or two before Voldemort showed up, but that is just absolutely not the case. So let's walk through the actual timeline. It starts in the autumn of 1979 when Dumbledore is interviewing Sybil Trelawney for a post at his school of witchcraft and wizardry, and she makes the prophecy which Snape overhears. Immediately after Snape tells Voldemort, and Voldemort assumes it's talking about the Potters. Snape then immediately freaks out and goes to Dumbledore and is like, can you please save Lily? So you would assume that right then, autumn 1979, maybe winter at the latest, the Potters go into hiding. Now I say assume because you can't actually nail it down, but that's not going to matter. But so for reference, Harry is born on July 31st, 1980, and the Potter family is attacked and killed on October 31st, 1980 making Harry exactly 15 months old when his parents die. So, how long had Peter been spying for Voldemort? Well, in Prisoner of Azkaban, Sirius says that he was funneling secrets to him for at least a year. So if they die in October of 1981, and Peter has been a spy since at least 1980, that is an entire year in which Voldemort could have killed the Potters, but doesn't. But again, we don't know exactly when they went into hiding, so Peter could have been the spy but not the secret keeper for a certain amount of time. We absolutely know that at least by the time Lily sends Sirius the thank you note for Harry's broomstick on the year of his first birthday that they are already in hiding because she says James is restless in the house. We also know from the letter when Peter visited them last. Wormy was here last weekend. I thought he seemed down but that was probably the news about the McKinnons. Oh, sad about the McKinnons, you think so? Afraid not, Lily. We, the reader, know that the real reason Peter is sad is because he has turned you over to Voldemort. Now, I know the book doesn't explicitly say that, but I do think this is an intentional case of dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is a literary technique originally used in Greek tragedy by which the full significance of a character's words or actions are clear to the audience, that's us, or reader, although unknown to the character. 
that's Lily. So the irony being that we know why Peter is sad, but Lily doesn't. So when was Peter at the Potters? Well, we know the letter was sent soon after Harry's first birthday on Friday, July 31st, 1981. So the last weekend referenced in the letter is actually August 1st or 2nd, Saturday or Sunday or both if he stayed the night. And yet, the Potters don't perish until October 31st. Why, why does Voldemort wait another three months? I mean, this is an inexplicable amount of time in which Voldemort absolutely knows where the Potters are and yet does not kill them. So, like, why is he waiting? Like, does he just want, does he want to do it on Halloween? Sure, you then have the advantage of that one little kid thinking you're in costume because of the holiday, and I agree crucial. But maybe the real reason is because he hadn't tracked down the final item he planned on turning into a horcrux. Maybe it's because he hadn't found the sword yet. We said earlier it would be pretty easy to manufacture a situation in which the sword presents itself to a worthy Gryffindor. And guess what we absolutely know happens between the time Lily sends that letter and Voldemort attacks the Potters. What happens is the deaths of a lot of members of the Order of the Phoenix. Specifically, Edgar Bones and his wife, Dorcas Meadows, Caradoc Dearborn, and Fabian and Gideon Pruitt. We know they all died inside that time period because of the photo Moody shows Harry of the original Order of the Phoenix where he says Marlene McKinnon died two weeks after this photo was taken. And again, Lily's letter said the McKinnons just died, so the photo must have been taken roughly two weeks before Harry's first birthday. And we know the war ends on October 31st, so everyone who died who was in that photo must have died inside that time frame. And of the people we listed, at least two of them are known to be Gryffindors. Molly Weasley's older brothers, Fabian and Gideon Pruitt. By the way, Fabian and Gideon, F and G, Fred and George. So adorable. And according to Moody, it took five Death Eaters to kill Fabian and Gideon, and they fought like heroes. Five versus two is definitely a situation under which I can see courage enough for the sword to present itself to the brothers, and then for the Death Eaters to win the fight anyway and give the sword to Voldemort. And while I'll admit that is pure speculation, it syncs up so well with why Voldemort waits to kill the Potters, because there, there has to be a reason. And it would mean that Voldemort doesn't just think he's completing his collection of Founder's Horcruxes, but that he's also killing the prophesized hero in Godric Gryffindor's hometown and turning Gryffindor's sword itself into the final Horcrux. And it would mean that when the sword presents itself to Harry in the Chamber of Secrets, it's appearing in the presence of the same two people it was in last time. And it adds some irony to the fact that what would have been the final Horcrux is the one that ends up destroying the rest. And the sword's unique ability to just present itself to worthy Gryffindors would explain why it was never found in the rubble, because it could have just disappeared again. <laughs> And yes, I know what you're thinking. Would the Pruitts have had access to the Sorting Hat when they were attacked by the Death Eaters? Were they attacked at Hogwarts? Well, honestly, I'm not sure you absolutely need the Sorting Hat to pull the sword out. It just has to be obtained under conditions of valor, according to Dumbledore, much like Harry in the Frozen Pond. Oh, you guys, I just genuinely love this here because I, I honestly believe it just makes sense. But one of the things that makes me curious is whether or not Voldemort even could have turned the sword into a horcrux. It's supposed to only absorb that which makes it stronger, and would Voldemort's soul have counted? Let me know your thoughts in the towel section down below. These socks are amazing! Guys, thanks as always for watching this video. Please remember to leave a like if you haven't already, and subscribe so you don't miss any Harry Potter action from us. If you want to see the rest of our Harry Potter theories or explanation videos, you can check out this card right here. Or if you want to support us on Patreon, we have just added a brand new reward level at $25. You can get quarterly exclusive Super Carlin Brothers lapel pins. This is the only way to get one. Here's what the first one is going to look like. I think it is going to be awesome. You can just click right here to support us on Patreon. But Ben, that's all I've got for you today, man. I will see you in another life, brother.